All right, great. Um, welcome, everyone. Our next speaker is Shrey Anand, uh, and he will be presenting on data science with Red Hat Insights. Shrey is a software engineer slash data scientist. I'm actually not sure what your title is um, at Red Hat in the AI Center of Excellence. I, I, and as always, I guess, if you notice any issues with the recording, please let me know. I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Hi, everyone. My name is Shri Anand. I am a data scientist with the AI Ops team, which is a part of AI Center of Excellence. Um, today, I'll be talking about data science with Red Hat Insights. And um, so all the work that I'll show has been done in collaboration with the AI Ops team. So thanks everyone who participated and gave feedback. Um, and we'll have a question on the session at the end. So feel free to ask any questions then. Um, that's it, let's jump into the slides. So I'm going to talk about Red Hat Insights and give you a feel of uh, how users interact with insights and what's the workflow like and what's, what's the problem that we're trying to address using insights. And I'll also give you examples of the kind of data that we collect from insights. Um, and then I'm going to go into two different projects, SAP data analysis and drift baseline suggestions. So one of them is data analysis part we try to where we try to visualize um, what's going on and then come up with insights from that and then there is drift baseline suggestions which is um, more on pattern recognition and data science data science stuff and then um, we try to come up with patterns there at the end i'll tie everything together um, and talk about other projects that we're doing that fall into the same bucket and also how we can improve the current approach. Um, so this is like a meme that I created uh, to walk you through the journey of uh, what happens when a customer runs into a problem. So imagine that you are a rel user and then your kernel starts to panic. So first thing that you would do is go to a support person and then try to figure out what's wrong. So Red Hat has incre incredible support team and then they would try to navigate the problem and then come up with appropriate solutions so um so your problem gets solved but that's not the end of the story right so there could be other people who face similar problems and in order to save uh the time of the uh, support engineers and also um uh, not to duplicate effort the problem and the solution that has been already uh, figured out are encoded in a KCS article, which is like a knowledge case article. So in so if there is someone else who has the same problem, they can always refer to that KCS article and then try to figure out what's what's wrong, right? So um, so that's there, but even that's like not the end of the story. So we have insights. So what insights does is pretty incredible. So we say that, okay, we know that these, like in, through the KCS articles, we know that if certain conditions are present in your system, then that would mean that your system could uh, go into a kernel panic, right? So what they have done is they have created an engine of these conditions and they say okay we'll uh, scan all the data in your system and see if these conditions are present 
And if these are present, then before the problem arrives, we're gonna uh, proactively warn you that, okay, your system may go into a panic, you need to fix these issues. And then, um, so we have a repository of these conditions. And then we also, in this process, we collect the data of all the systems. So we check this data using these rules and then see if there are any vulnerabilities. So um, this is like a, a well-defined process and uh, we have a team that creates all these incredible rules. But um, where we come in the picture is that we collect a lot of data from the systems and then we have these manually written if and then rules and these rules are pretty specific so uh, and also business critical right so if there is a kernel panic and then we know that it's because of this hardware error then we need to warn the users so these are pretty important rules but um, so there are other things that can be done with that data in the sense that we can come up with rules using data science and data analysis that are uh, maybe not hardware specific, but they that are um, like found that that can be mined by examining data from a lot of the users. So, for example, if there is a configuration file and the user is trying to edit that and they make some error and uh, a particular service or maybe even the system crashes because of that so we can like rectify those errors because we have seen a lot of these configuration files in in users across um, the rel family right so we um, using that information we can alert the users that, okay, you're doing something wrong in the configuration file. Now, we have to understand that there are only certain kind of errors that can be detected using data science, and then there are certain kind of errors that can be detected using like manual support engineers. So, um, so data science here is like trying to find these large scale errors so it's scalable so it can like uh, do a lot of these tasks for unknown environments so and that, that's where we come in and I'll elaborate more on the kind of projects that we're doing here uh, so yeah so before moving to that this is like a typical dashboard of Renat insights so you have these vulnerabilities um affecting your system so remember the, the rules that i talked about right so they, they check for these vulnerabilities and then show you in this dashboard um and similarly there's uh, there are other things that are going on here so right so in the process of um like finding these rules and also checking them through the data, we are collecting this data, right? So um, the examples on your screen are uh, some of the ways, like some of the data points that we collect. So on the left, you see hardware information and software information. So like who's the cloud provider, what's the architecture like, the bias vendor, the bias version, uh, and then also like the software information. So it's like, which services are enabled on your system, which are the installed packages, services, and modules. So um, these are like the software and hardware information that we get from the systems. And then there are also configuration files like I talked about. So this is this example is of, an, uh, if of a configuration file called SSST. And then there are a bunch of key value pairs here, access provider, uh, ID provider, Etc. So there are a bunch of services that can be configured using this file. Um, 
So that's that's what the data looks like. Now um, we can do like a bunch of things with this data. So the first thing that we can do is data analysis. So what that means is we can visualize different aspects of the data and find relationships between them. So if, for example, if we have three columns and then we want to see how they're related, um, we would um, like find the distributions, correlations, and all those things. So what that does is it helps us to understand the system better and then make decisions better. So one project that I'm going to show is um, SAP workload analysis, and hopefully that will clear things up for the data analysis part. The other thing that we can do uh, is data science. What that means is we are trying to find patterns in, in this data, and we are trying to see, um, like, given all this data, what are the patterns or what are the frequently occurring themes in that data. So drift baseline suggestion is an example that I'll go into details. Uh, and before I move on to that, I want to uh, emphasize that all the technologies that we used are open sourced. So for SAP workloads, we are using um, Superset, which is an open sourced um, business intelligence visualization software. And for all the data science work, we use Jupyter Hub, which is a part of Data Hub, and then it allows us to uh, have notebooks and then uh, like do all our do all our experiments on those notebooks. So uh, a big shout out to the Data Hub team who have helped us in like all the infrastructures that we need. So let's move on to the projects. Right, so SAP data analysis, um, so um, in this project, we are trying to explore exact like user systems and also the SAP systems that are installed on those user systems. So on your screen, you see an example topology of a user system. So um, the 5127 here is a system associated with uh, a Red RHEL Insights account. And then these are HA1, HA2, and BV2 are different SAP instances. And these are like IDs of SAP instances. So what we're trying to do here is that we are trying to see the SAP workloads that are spread over different machines in user account. So we want to visualize them and then we want to see the topology in order to uh, reorganize or maybe um, change how our systems are laid out. So I'm going to show you a dashboard, uh, the superset visualization tool that I talked about. So uh, the image that you that I showed you was of an account that was pretty simple, but this one is more involved. So we have all these, like the small dots, are uh, the systems associated with this particular insights account, and uh, the like the DAA here is again the SAP instance. SAP is um, like a business organization tool that a lot of uh, REL customers run on REL. So it's like worthwhile investigating how uh, these like workloads are organized. So oh, on your screen, you see that there are a lot of systems and oh, a lot of them have this particular type of uh, SAP instance. And then a lot of these systems have their own different types of S, uh, SAP instances. So uh, what this does is it gives you like an overview of 
how your systems are structured and then how you can better organize them so it gives you like a bird's eye view of what's going on so i think like that's really powerful and then also it it uh, shows what you can do with the right analysis so there are a bunch of other things that you can uh, see in this dashboard the link is attached in the presentation um so for example this graph shows uh so if we have accounts on the x-axis and the number of instances on the y-axis so it shows like which accounts have um, a lot of instances so we can see that this particular account has so many instances right and then like the, the other information here so coming back to the demo slides right so that was uh, the analysis data analysis part and then the second thing that we do is uh data science -y stuff so that's like drift baseline suggestion so that's one project that i'm going to explain um I'll, so i'll go into the notebook here so it may get technical for a bit uh but i'll try to make sure that everyone is on the same page uh so what is drift analysis so it's a visual tool that tracks changes in the environment. So the uh, remember the dashboard, like the insights dashboard that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so it's a part of that. And what it tries to do is, so if a user account has, let's say 300 systems. So what, what it's doing is it's giving them a way to compare those 300 systems. So for example, let's say one of your systems is crashing and then you want to pinpoint why that's happening. So one way of doing that could be, so you compare that system with a similar system and see, okay, um, well, this is crashing and this is not, and then these systems are similar. So what's wrong with this system or what's different with this system? And then you can compare them side by side. So drift, um, application allows you to do that so uh, on the so like this left column is one system and the right column is another system and then these are uh, like the points like or the uh, data points that insights collect so for example here this is like a Lenovo BIOS vendor and this is C BIOS. And then it's a physical, it's a virtual system, it's a bare metal, it's KVM. So these are the system, these are the differences that you can um, see in your systems and then compare them. So that's what drift analysis does. Um, what we are trying to do here is we are trying to recommend baselines. So what that means is, like I said, so in the example that I gave where a user was having issues with one of the systems, so they had to know which system was similar to their system in order to compare, right? Otherwise, there are 300 systems and you don't know which one to compare your system with. So you have to have a baseline. So in this project, what we're trying to do is that given an inventory of systems, we want to find groups in those systems. So we want to say that, okay, all the elements in this group are similar. And then from each of those groups, we want to recommend a baseline or a central point. So if you have a problem in one of your systems, then you'll find which group it belongs to. And then you'll compare that with the baseline and try to see, okay, what, what's different here? So, um, the image here shows these uh, systems and then the colors show the groups and i'm going to go into more detail uh, but where it's helping is that it will save time for users by identifying and recommending baselines and then also it will help in improving configuration management so that means like if you want to standardize all your systems in a group, then you can just like compare them and standardize, right? So uh, that's always better if you have standard systems. 
uh, so let's go into the demo. So um, this is the Jupyter Hub environment that I talked about. So you have to go to jupyterhub.datahub.com. You have to log in and then you'll arrive at this page. Um, and you have to select the drift analysis notebook. Anyone can do this, like anyone with a Red Hat account can do this. Uh, so you select this drift analysis notebook image. So what that'll do is it'll get all the dependencies that are required for this project and put it in your environment so that you don't have to do it on your own. And then you just click on spawn. Um, it'll take a couple of minutes to load the dependencies, create the environment and do everything. Um, yeah, so I have one that is already open. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through this notebook um, in detail. So let's um, talk about what we are doing here. So the first step here is to select features. Uh, so there were like these bunch of features that I showed you, right? And when we are finding the groups in our systems, all of those features may not be important. So you would want to find groups based on only certain features. For example, OS release and installed services, installed packages and kernel modules. So these are the only features that you would want to investigate. So you can just comment out the rest of them. You just keep these and then just comment out the rest of them. If you want, you can um, change this and then you will have a different grouping of systems. So that's the first step. And then um, second step, you encode uh, these variables. So what that means is that when you get information from uh, these features, a lot of them are categorical in nature. So uh, a statistical model may not understand what AMD or Intel or stuff like that means, right? So they need numbers in order for them to operate. So encoding is the process that converts all these categories and all these uh, like not suitable features into something that you can put in a model. So um, we have numerical features, we have categorical features. So we one hot the categorical features. So that basically means we give one bit to every category. And then when it's present, we say that that bit is turned on. When it's not, we say that the bit is turned off. And then uh, similarly, we have list of word features, which means like we have a list of services that are installed. Um, so again, we use something similar to a one hot encoding here. And so when we do that, we run into the problem of dimensionality. Uh, so we have 333 systems, but then when we encode them, we reach into right. So um, we have this problem of dimensionality reduction, where um, so we have a lot of these features when in the, in the encoded vector. So we have 333 systems, and then we have 25,000. Um, encoded vectors. So we want to reduce this number so that the statistical model is able to uh, computationally process that. And so we use a dimensionality reduction technique called UMAP, which reduces it to uh, 100 dimensions. And then we cluster based on that. So uh, in the clustering, we use something called k-means which would basically um, group these systems. And then it automatically finds that, okay, we have five different groups in, in the systems that we have provided based on the loss. Uh, and then we get to this image, right? The one that I showed. So what this means is that these dots are systems and 
the colors represent the groups so for example this is one group this is another the red one is another and the green one is another so like we have five of these the black dots represent the center of these systems and uh, also like the baselines that we recommend so for example if this system is failing then we compare it with this system and say okay um, let's see what's going what's going wrong um so yeah uh also like the number of groups here is important we automatically detected that based on laws but then you can also change it for example if you say that okay i i just want a completely different group for these elements and i just don't want them to be in the yellow group so you can increase that from 5 to 10 in the notebook and then you'll have different clusters so uh, there's also like some parameters available for the users to configure this uh and the next part of this notebook is based on interpreting what's going on in this clusters so i'm going to jump on to the inspecting function here so what we are trying to do is in the zeroth cluster we are trying to inspect the installed services so um so this provides like an overview of what's going on so it says that total elements in the cluster are 33 so and then we have all these services here and then we are trying to see um like the frequency so all these services are installed in all the 33 systems that belong to that group and all of them are in the baseline as well but as we scroll down um, we would come to some some services that are only installed in 31 of those systems so our clustering things that these groups are similar and uh, but like this particular services are only installed in 31 or 29 out of 33 so maybe we could also in order to standardize we could also put these services in the other systems or maybe if they're not required to move them um but like what what's what it's offering is that it'll give you uh, like a clear description of how your systems differ so um uh, so yeah that's it um so we saw here how to select features how we can encode those features and finally how we can uh, use them in the clustering i also have a detailed video of like each of those steps uh, because it wasn't like in the scope of this talk to cover everything uh, so i'll include that in the links as well so if you are interested, you could go through that and notebook as well. So it's pretty simple, right? So you, uh, when you spawn your notebook, you'll come to this page and you open the recent one, you go to the demo, you open the baseline demo and you'll basically come to this place. Uh, so you don't have to do, you don't have to get any dependencies. You can just like come and play with this notebook. So coming back to the slides, um, So before I leave uh, and then uh, like let you guys ask questions, there are some other projects that we are doing. Uh, so there is this configuration file analysis that I hinted in the beginning where we're trying to detect errors in configuration files so that we find those patterns and then we can alert users that, okay, so these are things that can go wrong with your configuration files. Then there's also KC, KCS article predict classification. So remember uh, in the initial example, I was talking about these KCS articles and how we make if and then rules out of these. So um, we also did a project where we had these KCS articles and then we were reading the text, like the problems and the solutions, then try to figure out whether it'll make a good rule for insights. Uh, and also like we, in one of the projects we were trying to figure out which systems are outliers or 
so in those 300 systems, let's say one system is completely different. And then we were trying to figure that out and see whether or not that could be a problem. And then, um, so yeah, so those are sort of like some other projects that we did and we are continuing, continuing right now. Um, so I hope I was able to give you some intuition about insights, the data, that we collect and also the analysis that we can do and the pattern recognition and data science projects that we can do with this data. So with that, uh, I am going to open the floor for questions. All right, I have to add Shay back in. There you go. All right, great. Thanks, Patrick. That was really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of noise coming from your mic. Could you adjust that a little bit? Is it better? Yeah, I think so. I think it was too close, so we could hear you breathing. Okay. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with breathing. <laughs> All right. I can so, stop that if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you sound good. Um, great. Yeah, so folks, so floor is open for questions. Um, but while we wait for someone to get their confidence up, is I have a question again. Red Hat, open source. Are these notebooks available for anyone to try sitting with? Are they on public GitHubs or anything? That's a good question. So um, right now, no, but we are working on. So like you can understand, this is. Um, customer data, right? And um, so we have a lot of privacy issues there. But we are working on anonymizing this data and also um, putting out like the first few notebooks that deal with public data on uh, open source repositories. So um, in short, right now, it, like publicly, it's not available. But it should be soon. You answered my next question, which is: Are there any plans to open source some of this data? You know, and the not, and not, and the not. Making the data, no, yes, data, yeah. data science terms, <laughs> yeah, anonymizing the, it. There you go. That's a top priority on our uh, like next things to do. So. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think a lot of people could. I think it's something the community would find interesting. Um, similar way, um, I like hearing about when people struggle with their work. So <laughs> what were some of the biggest challenges you faced with this? Um, I think like, so the biggest challenge here would be just to deal with the systems data. I think when we do our education and like study about data science, we get all these um, like comfortable data sets that are um, cleaned and um, also like natural language or computer vision and all, all those kinds of stuff. But like we never really get to deal with data that's noisy and um, you know, real world. So one of the biggest challenges for me in the beginning was that um, to deal with systems data because I've never, I would like, I never did that in school or anywhere else. And then also deal with noisy data. Um, so that, that's purely from a data science perspective. And then from an organizational view, I think the challenging part was to collaborate with other teams because um, so you, you cannot possibly exist in a silo and keep working on something because the end user for your model or your project has to be continuously involved. So um, from that perspective, you learn a lot in how to collaborate with other people, how to be responsive. I'm still learning. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's a continuing process. So that's, um, that's another thing, I guess. 
I think a lot of us can agree, like those organizational challenges are sometimes bigger than the technical problems, right? Like figuring out how to work with people and just building that right sort of relationship. I think, yeah, definitely. And I think, I think definitely there's a lot that. of hit and trial as well. So yeah. sometimes things just don't work and then you have to keep move on and uh, keep trying new things. So are you talking about life or work right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it can be applied anywhere, but like yeah. <laughs> um, cool, cool, cool. Um, I had something else which I, yeah. So, you know, with all this data and like kind of a lot of what you're doing, sort of exploratory. What what do you think would be the coolest, or where do you see this data and like being most useful long term? And this may not be a question you can answer since it's, well, you know, kind of restricted data, but. What do you think is the coolest thing? Um, that's a good question. So the, there can be a lot of things that can be done. So we already have, for example, insights, right? We already have a platform that's there. Um, one like low hanging fruit would be to include um, all these kind of analysis and AI thing that we are doing uh, into that already existing platform as features, right? That so having an active integration with uh, existing software would be pretty cool for a data science team. And I think so that, that's like a challenge that we can solve, and then we are already trying to do that uh, in long term something really cool can be uh, building systems from scratch that rely on AI. And um, that would mean solving harder problems like um, root cause analysis or causation models that Gordon was suggesting, uh, trying to figure out why your kernel is panicking or, and in an unknown environment, why something happens. Um, and then trying to figure out those policies or rules. Um, so I think if we ever come to that stage where we can um, algorithmically deal with an unknown environment, that would be really cool. I think, or from where I stand, I think this is something that operators could really benefit from, right? Like this whole idea of open shift operators, which are which can be self-remediating and all. And if you can start pulling in machine learning models, which were trained with this customer data, maybe we can start solving problems before they happen, which, is, which I think is always the dream. Right. Yeah, so. Um, so this was fun. Thank you, Anish, for asking these questions and everyone who watch the video. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for putting this together for us. This was some really cool stuff. So again, have a great day. Um, and we'll see you around. Bye. Bye. So for every well, I'll just, yeah. So for everyone else who's still here, um, don't leave quite just yet. We have an exciting panel coming up uh, with some experts from the AICOE. Um, they'll be talking about machine learning and it'll be like a, a panel. So really, any questions you have, um, they're happy to answer them. So we'll see you soon.